So our first article is from the Jur Journal of American Medical Directors Association. And we are going to, see, we're going to talk about a visit to visit blood pressure variability and progression of white matter hypertensity among older people with hypertension. This article was done by Tessa Van Mendelar and um, Edel Richard were the lead authors and it is an original study. So what they are looking at for this study is they wanted to understand how the blood pressure variability from visit to visit will impact white matter hypertensities and if there was any relationship between the progression of white matter hypertensities intensities um, with BP variability. This study is all derived as a sub-study from the prevention of dementia by intensive vascular care study. And they looked at the MRIs, um, which occurred at six to eight years after um, evaluating those, um, those identified participants to randomize groups. So those groups were either the, the, the group who were going to get the MRIs or the groups who were getting frequent um, blood pressure checks and um, with those MRIs. When they looked through to figure out the number of, um, of participants, they went through all the data from the pre-DIVA study and they were able to identify 122 participants who had all of the right criteria as to getting their MRIs um, done appropriately and coming back in for their um, blood pressure um, measurements at the three to five um, twice yearly intervals. Their characteristics of this population, um, we saw that the average, average age was 73.8 years. The majority of um, participants were um, women. And um, we looked at how their blood pressure, um, where, where the blood pressure was um, reading at. So for all of those participants who were included and excluded, they had pretty much the same blood pressure readings of, of, of averaging about 160 over 80. We also, um, they weren't excluded depending on how many blood pressure medications they were or any other of those criteria, but they were um, identified them. What we did find with, as you, we read through this study, was that we saw that with even the, um, the minute changes in systolic blood pressure variability, there was an association with white matter um, hypertensity progression. It was not seen for diastolic blood pressure, but it was a statistical significant um, change for systolic blood pressures. They also looked at changes in the total brain volume um, versus other comorbidities. So they looked at for those members, those um, um, patients who had multiple medications or were on no medications. They also looked at um, individuals who had a history of um, cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular disease equivalent. They, um, while they found that there was some changes, it wasn't enough to report a statistical significant um, change. What this study concluded, the authors concluded that higher visit to visit systolic blood pressure and pulse pressure variability was associated with the progression of white matter hyperintensity. And it was recommended to inter that the intervention um, for our, our elderly population that they studied was to reduce visit to visit blood pressure variability. The reason that I, this study stood out to me is because of some of those takeaways that we need to really look at. You know, it, it was interesting if you ever had a chance to go back into the journals, you'll find that there was a lot of editorials around this study because, you know, it, it asked that question, are we, um, are we looking at our um, 70 year old plus population the correct way? You know, what is the impact of lowering blood pressure in this population? And are we achieving our goal? Um, and if one of our goals is to reduce cognitive decline, are we achieving that? And our, the, the, the question that I hope to answer as we move on through the Journal Club today is, are we leading to increased adverse events? This really brings us to the second study, which was a treatment of hypertension in people with dementia, a multi-center perspective 
an observational cohort study. And this was done by Welsh, Gordon, and Gladman. The purpose of this study was to identify the proportion of individuals with dementia and hypertension, review the prescribed hyper, um, antihypertensives, um, review adverse health events, and look at the proportion of those individuals who we achieve a targeted blood pressure. And if we recall that many of the studies that we have done up to date are um, on um, reducing blood pressure have not always included our oldest of old population. Um, we see that the guidelines are based usually on people who are younger than 65. So it's important as we look at these studies to really remember that most of the published studies um, have guidelines that we may be, may be adhering to that are not really addressing the population that we're serving. So are we treating the individuals based off those guidelines or are we give it a more individualized approach of which is the best um, uh, overall approach that we would have? And I, I know I have my opinions and I'm sure you have yours. With this hypertensive and dementia study, they, as we said, it's a multi-center perspective observational cohort. They identified um, those members based off of face-to-face -face, um, assessments. They looked at their blood pressure, their ADLs, cognitive function, and medication use. Um, they initially settled on 181 participants, um, but 171 actually completed the follow-up. So when we look at the characteristics, um, you know, we see that there, there were no major discrepancies. Um, majority of the population was female. The average age was 82. They looked at people who were independent in um, their homes and, and or lived in residential homes. So not really so much in the nursing home population. They also um, um, tracked how many antihypertensive agents were prescribed and what, if, given that number, how, how, what was our blood pressure at for each of those targets? So, you know, I think it's interesting to see that even with um, um, that we're prescribing down here five antihypertensives and our mean systolic is around 137 with a diastolic of um, 65. In conclusion, what they found was that individuals with mild dementia are treated with antihypertensives in similar proportions to those, to, um, those um, who do not have dementia and with similar proportions achieving um, the targeted blood pressure. And what I think is really important for us to, to think about is that we have these individuals with um, significant cognitive impairment to the point that they're at, um, meeting the criteria of having dementia. And, you know, we are still treating them according to the guidelines. The, the question is, is that the correct um, thing to do? When we look um, further into the study, what they found was that the rate of adverse events were higher in this population. So they didn't show a graphic for this, but we saw that there were about 214 falls, um, three fractures resulting requiring surgical intervention, and there was one person who passed away, but um, that may have been for um, a, a number of reasons. But it is to, you know, it is, it all met the criteria of adverse health events. So what we found in this population is even when they are, you know, we're seeing that the majority of their physicians are treating them according to the guidelines, but we're also having a significantly higher um, rates of adverse health events, which leads us to some takeaways to consider, you know, there still remains a fair amount of inconsistency surrounding the management of blood pressure in the older adults. We still do not have a golden standard for how to approach these individuals. I think, you know, I lead and my bias is to lean on a more of an individualized approach with treating um, um, these patients. You really have to get to, under, get to know and understand um, how they respond to things. And you have to be careful when you're adding and pushing more medications in spite of what some of the guidelines may say. The other takeaway is, you know, thinking about the impact of this conflict, the information on the prescribing clinician. 
for those of us who are um, maybe ger geri geriatricians or geriatric certified or practice in um, the post-acute long-term care space every day, we we see that you know there's differences and there's other considerations. But our colleagues who are in private practice um, or um, a group setting practice, the hospital list, they may practice differently and they may be adding the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs and all of those medications just based off of guidelines and they don't see the long-term um, consequences or we don't always recognize adverse health events as consequences of over achieving your goals with um, the, t the blood pressure in given that population was never studied. So I think it's really important when we're looking at hypertension to always um, think about that. I'm going to keep going, and now we're going to get into some heart failure studies that I thought were really interesting. Both the, uh, were published in um, JAMDA as well. The first is predicting future health transitions among newly admitted nursing home residents with heart failure. And this study was a retrospective cohort study. Um, they plotted mortality and hospitalizations over one year stratified the patients by um, the chest score. It tests the changes in health and in stage disease size and symptoms. And they ended up with a final sample that included 143,067 residents. So very, um, very interesting, like a large population that they were looking at. They spin tracked five types of transitions over a 90-day period and looked at the follow-up. So they were able to stratify those to um, those patients who had a chest score of zero to um, the first state and then those with a chest score of one to two to second state and a chest score to three to five um, the um, state three. Then they looked at where they went. So did they go to home versus another care setting like an ALF or um, were they ho um, re-hospitalized or were they discharged? Um, did they pass away and um, discharge to death basically? <laughs> they, the demographics and um, clinical characteristics for this group were similar to um, some of the other groups that we saw. We saw that, you know, those um, individuals that we have more female than male, you know, the chest scores, and I don't have it um, here in this presentation, but it's really interesting to look at because when we're looking at the chest scores, they really reflect health instability and they measure at a scale of zero to five, five being the highest degree of instability and greatest risk of death. When um, you compare chest to like the New York Health Association functional class for heart failure, chest is able to give a more precise estimate of mortality risk than um, the New York Health Association. So it is interesting in um, trying to include this in our, with our patients who are in nursing facilities because it, it does seem to have a higher sensitivity for that. So when we're looking at the clinical characteristics, we see that we have a fair amount of people who were in that um, chest score of zero. Um, but then we see we have some who are at the one and the two level, um, a few at the three and four. When we look through at the diagnoses, though, you see that we have a lot of the individuals with hypertension, um, chronic obstructive disease, Alzheimer's, dementia. So there was a good mixture of comorbidities as well. This table, um, this figure shows the trend that we started to see. So the dashed line is for those individuals with a chest score of zero, and the light gray line is for those individuals with a chest of one to two, and um, the darker line is for a chest um, um, score of three plus. And this is hospitalization and mortality rates among those residents. We find in this first box, the hospitalizations, um, you know, as we would expect, we would see more hospitalizations for those who are um, at a higher chest score. Um, we also see 
um, they looked at it for those who were without heart failure. They looked at those who ha um, had without heart failure who had passed away, and they actually ranked high um, as far as chest result um, scores. And then those individuals who um, did pass away, they looked at what their chest scores were for those residents with heart failure. So I don't think it's anything is surprising that we would see that those individuals who are in that higher um, um, bucket have are more stable and have a higher risk of having a negative outcome. This demonstrates the population of um, those with and without heart failure who either died or were hospitalized for the first 90 days after the nursing home um, admission. So it's just a direct comparison of that. And they're also defined on chest scores. It is no surprise here um, that we see um, those with a chest score of five being the greatest. The conclusions were that heart failure and health instability provide significant information that can be used to predict transfers, deaths, and adverse outcomes. And when we are looking at the way medicine is changing in the landscape, we do see that we have more tools now available to us, more decision support tools. And it, it would be curious, I'm curious to see how we incorporate these um, scoring systems and um, approaches to those decision support tools that maybe help us identify those individuals who are at risk. So identifying at risk patients for targeted interventions would be useful to reduce transfers to acute care was another conclusion that they made. And I think the takeaways were are which assessment tools are we using to risk stratify our nursing home residents. So if you think back and um, for those of you who may be involved in your facilities coffee or other um, programs for quality, you know, are what what tools are we using? You know, we all go through the MDS, but what tools do we really use to to look at the, these populations of individuals who have heart failure? And how do we practically utilize risk assessment tools in our everyday practice? And what interventions for heart failure do we have in the post acute long-term care space. I think a lot of us see that our facilities now have um, ways to identify things, but what treatment plans, um, what what tool, what opportunities do we have to treat in place um, or intervene so that that person can be stabilized in the building, you know, readily having laces available, do we have, or um, furosemide, um, do we have um, other interventions or uh, how do we um, look at that individual? Do they get vitals daily, vitals every shift um, for the first three to four days that they're there? You know, so those kind of things. What are we doing so that we're really intervening given that we know that this population is greatly at risk? So this brings us to our fourth and final article, which is the risk of readmission after discharge from skilled nursing facilities following heart failure hospitalization. And this is a retrospective cohort um, study. Um, it looked at Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries 65 and older with heart failure, discharge to SNF, then to home. So it was one of those few studies that really focused in on what happens following that discharge, and I really appreciated that. Patients were followed 30 days post-discharge from the SNF. And they looked at 67,585 heart failure hospitalizations discharged to SNF with subsequent discharge to home. So this is just a flow chart to see how we got to um, that 67,585. They were able to um, retrospectively look at a million, over a million um, cases. The characteristics of those discharged for, um, home from SNF, you know, we see that we had more, you know, the median age was 84. I think that there was, um, you know, pretty fair representation given the community that they were looking at. But the length of stay in the hospital is where I want you, will want you to focus in on. Um, we see that most of these members had, or um, individuals had seven days in the hospital, an average of 17 days in the SNF. And I think that's going to come become more important as we start discussing 
the study a little bit more. This is a very interesting graphic. It's the readmission densities by lithostate and the SNF. And so what they really were able to look at is how do the readmission patterns differ for those individuals who were in the SNF for one to six days, seven to 13 days, or 14 to 30 days. What they found is that the risk for hospitalization um, for 30 days after SNF, you know, when we're looking at this study, you know, it was two to four times higher immediately after SNF to home discharge. So in that, um, that first one to two days, that first 40 hour, eight hours of going home um, from the SNF was the highest risk. And that carried um, within that, like the 48 hour mark, 72 hour mark, and then, then the 96 hour mark. But when you see that a member, a, a individual, pardon me, was in the SNF for one to two weeks, that readmission risk dropped by half. So, you know, it's to say that there may be um, the benefit of having uh, a more, a, a longer stay in the SNF and getting those, those therapeutics and that treatment and that medication evaluation that we would hope we're, all of those individuals are receiving um, are really showing a benefit in keeping them um, from going back to the hospital. So this is just showing that outcome um, in a different way, where we're seeing that um, how everything lines up with the length of stay of the SNF. And then really looking at um, how that impacts what happens on day zero to two um, versus days three to 30 for um, those individuals who are discharged um, to home. So in conclusion, the hazard rate of readmission after SNF discharge is highest during the first 48 hours at home. And the goal uh, to reduce hospitalizations for residents with heart failure, need, we, need to then, we need to focus in on interventions that helps us from SNF to home transfer. So we need to find those solutions to um, really reduce those hospitalizations and readmissions. The takeaways to consider is that in an effort to reduce SNF to acute hospital readmissions, have we neglected to introduce innovations for SNF to home transition? I think, um, and you may think back to what your facilities are doing, when we are out and about, we hear a lot about readmission back to acute, readmission after the first um, 48 hours, 72 hours of a person being in a SNF, you know, how we break that down. But given um, the, the realities of, of the way we have to practice now, we need to really look at those innovations to keep a person home once we discharge them to home from the SNF, you know, and look at all all of the obstacles and roadblocks that could come in the, that initial 30 days. So we have to ask what tools and services and interventions do we have to improve SNF to home transitions? A lot of people may think at the first thought of home health care. I would say that if you are going to be utilizing home health care services, you really want to ask that question of them because you want to know what they can do for the heart failure patients. Are they able to monitor their waste? What um, systems and instrumentation do they have to detect any um, shifts in weight balance and what um, tools and programs are they able to implement in the home and how can we effectively use home health care to improve transitions from SNF to home which goes back to just the comment that I just made I just mentioned so we really have to be asking those home health companies what we want and um, telling them what we need um, and not really just subject to what they could do. I always say that you have to shop around and make sure you're working with um, groups that you can truly partner with. With that, I thank you for your participation. And if you have any questions, I would gladly answer them. Thank you.